Hey, what's good, self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great, and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital, and today we're going to do a midweek update in the world of cannabis. So before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, all I ask is that you leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And then, of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, make sure you subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos. And then there's plenty of episodes for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the facts and news in one place so that you can get used to the industry, get used to the companies, and eventually take action when you are ready. But we're going to start today as it has officially closed. The Tilray and Afria merger uh, has come into effect, creating the new Tilray, a global cannabis leader. Uh, so it's good to know that Tilray shares will continue trading on the NASDAQ under the symbol Tilray. Starting May 5th, 2021 today, Tilray shares will commence trading on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol Tilray. Check out their new logo. Now, they will always be Afria to me, and seeing as Afria is sort of sentimental because it was my first big investment that saw me 4x my money and allowed me to to you know start phase two of my plan to get some of that cash into us msos uh it's 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 been a great learning experience and you know it's a sad day that we lose the afria name but they'll always be afria to me now what does this mean on uh, ultimately going forward we expect that the business combination will provide among others the f following financial and strategic benefits so these are again just highlighting the main reasons why they merged in the first place we'll create the world's largest cannabis global cannabis company the combination of a free and Tilray brings together two highly complementary businesses to create the leading cannabis focus cb company with the largest global geographic footprint in the industry. Fact. Um, especially with their diversified assets in Germany and Portugal, they do have that head start in Europe now, which is great. Strategic footprint and operational scale. We believe the company has the strategic footprint and operational scale necessary to compete more effectively in today's consolidating cannabis market with a strong, flexible balance sheet, strong cash balance, and access to capital, which we believe will give the company the ability to accelerate growth and deliver long-term sustainable value for stockholders low-cost state-of-the-art production and the leading cannabis adult use cannabis producer that is pretty much a fria what, what tilray got out of the deal the demand for the company's products will be supported by low-cost state-of-the-art cultivation processing and manufacturing facilities and it will have a complete portfolio of branded cannabis 2.0 products to strengthen its leadership position in canada position to pursue an accelerated international growth strategy the company is well positioned to pursue growth opportunities with its strong medical cannabis brands distribution network in germany and end-to-end -end european union good manufacturing practices supply chain, which includes its production facilities in Portugal and Germany, and enhanced consumer packaged goods presence and infrastructure in the U.S. In the U.S., Tilray has a strong consumer packaged goods presence and infrastructure with two strategic pillars, including Sweetwater, a leading cannabis lifestyle branded craft brewer, and Manitoba Harvest, a pioneer in branded hemp, CBD, and wellness products with access to 17,000 stores in North America. In the event of federal permissibility, the company expects to be well positioned to compete in the U.S. cannabis market given its existing strong brands and distribution system in addition to its track record of growth and consumer packaged goods and cannabis products. So while their focus now will be in Canada and in building up Europe with the medical model, they will have access when that's ready. And then, of course, there's substantial synergies. This is not substantial. Saving $81 million, that's just an excuse, uh, I think, that they added on. But regardless, Tilray, Afria is now Tilray. And um, after the deal, the new Tilray eyes global cannabis brands. I want to just jump through this article quickly, just to, again, highlight where they at, where, they're, where they sit right now. You already have diverse assets. A cannabis cultivation facility in Portugal, the Sweetwater Brewing Beer brand in Atlanta, the Manitoba Harvest Hemp Food Company in Canada, and CC Pharma, the, pharmacal, the pharmaceutical distributor based in Germany. What comes next? It's a three-part strategy, says Simon. In Canada, where we already have 17% to 18% market share, my objective is to get to a 30% market or a 30% share of the overall adult use market, and that's going to be by selling adult use medical products and cannabis 2.0 products, which are drinks and edibles. And I think it's important to note that in Ontario, Canada's most populated province, the government is opening 120 stores a month for the rest of 2021, which means by the end of this year, like seven months from now, Ontario is going to have over a thousand stores. And the more stores means more legal access to, to legal cannabis as opposed to going to the black market. It brings down the cost of cannabis and it could help them get to that 30% up from where they sit right now. That will involve coming out with new products and expanding our brands. But again, the, the store openings does help them do that, uh, coincidentally. And secondly, in Europe, which is known for medical cannabis today, we already have a distribution system in place to sell more medical cannabis uh, at 13,000 active pharmacies, sourcing it from our Portuguese facility and selling it throughout Europe. So that is a big play. And then what about the U.S.? I imagine that's the third part of the strategy. And that really depends on legalization when the U.S. makes that decision. So that's not anything that they can control. We will have consumer products standing ready for recreational use in the U.S 
U.S. once legalization occurs, we'll look to do an acquisition in consumer packaged goods world that will help us parlay into recreational cannabis. We may also do something in the medical world in the U.S., for example, a topical cream. So definitely at this point, worth just watching Tilray, seeing where they go from here and trying to consider getting in at any low points if you feel that they will uh, be able to dominate and have a, a step up in the long run having that, that big footprint in, in the European Union right now. And on top of that, an ex-Coke lawyer takes top legal role at cannabis giant Tilray, so obviously uh, you want to hire the top lawyers or the top people in any sort of um, area of expertise. And so a former Coca-Cola lawyer will become the new interim chief legal officer for Tilray, the world's largest weed operation by revenue, uh, the company announced Monday. Total revenue, not just cannabis revenue, uh, to be fair. Tilray and Afria Inc., a rival Canadian cannabis company it agreed to acquire in December, confirmed May 3rd the completion of that $3.8 billion deal and the appointment of a new executive leadership team. Tilray's general counsel, Daryl Redler, will serve as interim legal chief and corporate sec secretary of the combined company, which will use the Tilray name. Redler didn't respond to a request for comment about the interim status of her new position. In a message on LinkedIn, though, Redler said that she was proud to be part of the new Tilray leading the way in global cannabis. So uh, obviously doesn't mean much, but you wanna just make sure that you're bringing in top talent from other industries that have experience getting your products and your brands, you know, Around the, around the world globally and into new markets. So on top of that though, the best news, Illinois cannabis sales continue to smash records with revenue exceeding that of liquor. So love to see that on May 5th, they've already got the numbers for April. Legalized medical or legalized cannabis sales in Illinois continue to smash all sorts of records with the state now exceeding 1 billion in recreational weed sales and setting a new record for sales in the month of April. According to the latest data available from the state's Department of Revenue, Illinois recorded nearly 115 million in sales in the month of April alone, the highest grossing month since cannabis became legal last year. By comparison, the state saw 37 million in sales during the month of April 2020 last year. So just think about that. In all, Illinois has now racked up over a billion dollars in recreational cannabis sales since legalization took place January 2021. Of those sales, nearly 777 million were made to in-state residents, according to the Department of Revenue. The state also set another remarkable record in the first quarter of 2021 with tax revenues for cannabis sales, 86 million exceeding those of liquor, 72 million for the first time ever. If the trend continues, the state is expected to surpass 1 billion in sales in 2021 alone, according to officials, which means it'll take them just two years. It takes Illinois just two years to do $1 billion in an entire sales year, which is massive. So if we look up, they started the year January, sales hit 88 million, February hit 80 million. Uh, so a bit of a slump after January and there's less days in February, but then March, a big 109 million out the gate. And then April, 114.9 million. Um, and look, 35 million coming from out of state residents. This is where par parking lots in Illinois are filled from license plates from those around the state that do not have legal access themselves. And they come to Illinois and are willing to fund Illinois taxes with their own money because they can't get it where they, where they live. So this is great to see just that the growth in states where cannabis, adult use cannabis was recently legalized just continues to grow. There's little stopping that. So on top of this, I want to bring you some awesome resources I found on Twitter. This one from Max Mosner. Uh, per headset stifle, total number of sales uh, and amount of sales across all markets where they track data up 30% year over year in April. So that's 30% from April 2020. That's a big number. And in rebounding Nevada, sales were up 71%. And in red hot Pennsylvania, sales were up 79%. Flower up over 103% from again, April 2020. Top four brands with market share in Pennsylvania happen to be Green Thumb Industries, Cresco Labs, Terra Ascend, and Truly. Now, so this is a, a screenshot that he got from Stifle, apparently per headset. So and this little screenshot highlights Pennsylvania's top brands latest three months ending April 2021. And number one was Green Thumb Industries with their brand Rhythm. Number two was Cresco Labs with their brand Cresco Labs. Number three was Terra Ascend with their brand Kind Tree Cannabis. Number four was True Leave with Pure Pen. Number five, Terra Pen Care Station is a private company, so not an MSO that I talk about. Uh, G Leaf is Columbia Care. Grassroots is Cure Leaf. Calypso is another private company, not publicly listed. And then Prime Wellness of Pennsylvania is Acreage. So it's nice to see which brands uh, are selling uh, and which MSOs are behind the top selling brands in Pennsylvania for the latest three months. That's always nice. And on top of that, uh, Cashflow underscore free, a great resource on Twitter. I recommend anyone in the cannabis space follow. He has been uh, updating this 
this uh, amazing resource as of May 1st, 2021, where you can see the companies by tier, tier one cannabis operators, tier two cannabis operators down here, and tier three. Then you've got the share price, their total calculated shares, their calculated market cap, and calculated enterprise value, which refers to their book value. And on top of that, we have how much outstanding debt the company has here. And then in this column, we have the number of stores open now versus the number of licensed and total stores that they can open in time. And then it breaks down the revenue estimates for last year or what they did last year for 2021 and for the next year, 2022. Then then we have the EBITDA estimates, which is their earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, which shows profitability, what they did in 2020, what they expect to do in 2021, and what they expect to do in 2022, which will be next year, and how much revenue growth they're expecting from last year, 2020, up until 2022. And then you can look at the EBITDA margin percentages, uh, their calculated enterprise value to sales multiples, um, and enterprise value to EBITDA multiples. And ideally, especially, I like to look at the enterprise value to sales multiples. The lower uh, the multiple, the better deal you are getting based on the sales that they're expecting to come in 2021 and 2022. Uh, a great resource, again, I'd recommend going to follow uh, cashflow underscore free, but that is there for you. Another one we have, um, Thomas George and Scott Willis, they are the ones that run Grizzle, which is a cannabis research brand, uh, an education brand as well. But one thing that they, they highlighted in one of their recent videos is their portfolio update. So I wanted to show you firsthand while, I mean, you know, they're nice enough to share it on here. I would recommend you go follow them because they're great resources as well. But they're showing us what they're invested in. Their largest holding is Cresco Labs, then True Leaf, then Cure Leaf, uh, then Green Thumb. And so if we look at their weighting in May, obviously they've changed it. So they're they're a bit more active in their trading and they move it around more. But based on what they had in May, Cresco 35%, True Leaf 25%, Cure Leaf 20%, Green Thumb 20% of their portfolio. Now, most of their money is in the small mid US stocks because obviously smaller cap gives you more potential for your money to increase because they're valued at either $2 billion market cap or less. So again, much smaller, uh, worth less, has the potential to increase more over time as opposed to some of the bigger MSOs. Uh, their largest holding is Virio at 40%, then Terrascent at 25%, Gage at 10%, Jushi at 10%, Consortium at 5%, Harvest at 5%, and Verano at 5%. Their Canadian LP picks, they only have the two, either Free at Tilray uh, and Village Farms. Ironic, but similar to just the, the only two that I would view uh, considering investing in. But again, that's just me, my opinion. But that being said, they have increased their weighting into the new Tilray up to 70% with the remaining 30% of the Canadian investments in Village Farms International. And then lastly, they do invest in cannabis equipment, a very fast growing part of the industry as well. Uh, grow Generation, 45% of their portfolio is in them, which is the Home Depot of Cannabis. 35% of their portfolio is in Scott's Miracle Grow, which I imagine covers the soil and a lot of the growing materials needed for home grows. And then Hydro Farms farm with 20%. I don't know much about Hydro Farm, but I imagine there's plenty of opportunity for new companies in this space to get into uh, and take advantage of. But I just wanted to show you this as we get to peek into someone else's portfolio so you can weigh that against your own plan and your own judgment and make any sort of adjustments accordingly based on the new information. And Natalie Fertig covers cannabis policy with Politico, uh, providing us with a co-sponsor update, telling us the Safe Banking Act got five new Senate co-sponsors in the month of April. Added Tim Kaine, Mark Warner, Senator Baldwin, Senator Lujan, and Senator Mark Kelly. So there are now 27 Democrats, two independents, and seven GOP co sponsors for this bill. And if we do need 60, uh, it's nice to see that at least two independent and seven GOP sponsors are already on it so far. Uh, we've got plenty of time, it's just a matter of being patient, as I, I would say that very often, but that is very important to see success as an investor. And Verano to report first quarter 2021 financial results on May 18th, 2021. So they will be releasing results for their first quarter, um, which is again, January, February, and March, 2021. Uh, uh, before the market opens on Tuesday, May 18th. And on top of that, Cresco to report their first quarter 2021 financial results on May 27th and announces conversion to US GAAP accounting. So they will announce their first quarter end results from January to March 31st, 2021. On Thursday, May 27th, before market opens, Cresco will be going last again. Love to see that. The company also announced that it will, for the first time, report its financial results under accounting principles generally accepted in the United States, US generally accepted accounting principles, resulting in the later reporting uh, date than typical. The conversion from IFRS to US GAAP has been made to further prepare Cresco Labs for future capital market opportunities in the US and to more closely align with reporting standards familiar to US investors and stakeholders. Love it. 
Now, on top of that, MSOs did come heavy with lots of updates this week. Green Thumb Industries enters the Virginia cannabis market, so they're happy to announce that it has signed a definitive agreement to acquire 100% of Dharma Pharmaceuticals LLC, expanding its cannabis distribution network in the Virginia cannabis market. Dharma was the first operator to provide medical products to Virginia's patients in 2020 and is strategically positioned to scale in the emerging adult use market. Virginia became the first southeastern state in the United States to legalize adult use cannabis after the Virginia General Assembly approved legalization on April 7, 2021. This follows several post-election legalization initiatives at the state level, including New York in March and New Mexico in April, bringing the total to 17 states and three U.S. territories with legal and regulated cannabis programs for adult use over 40% of the U.S. population. While Virginia currently allows cannabis access only to qualified medical patients, adult use sales are expected to commence in January 2024. So keep that in mind. It's a long ways out until they can actually sell to the adult use cannabis market 2024 and we're only 2021. But what this does is get them into the medical market there so that they can build their systems efficiently in the state of Virginia and then be ready to capitalize when that switch does eventually come. With a population of nearly 8. 5 million people, Virginia is expected to generate over 1.5 billion in legal cannabis sales, creating significant tax revenue for the Commonwealth and employ thousands of Virginians. So the only thing I noticed in here is it doesn't tell us how much that they paid, so I would love to know how much, but I imagine that will come later. But upon completion of the acquisition, Green Thumb will have presence in 13 markets, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Florida, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, Nevada, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. As one of only five licensees in Virginia, in the Virginia medical cannabis market, Dharma is licensed to grow, process, and retail cannabis and sell retail cannabis directly to consumers. The acquisition includes an existing production facility and retail dispensary located in Abingdon, Virginia. Green Thumb will also maintain its opportunity to open up five, up to five additional retail locations in the Commonwealth, which is great. So this is expected to close the second half of 2021. Also want to add is that companies don't have to include the price that they paid. Typically when they do, it's, you know, because they're happy about it or they thought they got a good deal and they're showing off. So it's not that they're being shady by not showing it. I just would love to know, but I'm sure we'll, we'll find that out in the future. On top of that, Cureleaf announces changes to its footprint in um, Maryland. So in this state, in connection with the reorganization, Cureleaf has completed the acquisition of Maryland Compassionate Care Wellness, LLC, which operates a 55,000 square foot co-located cultivation and processing facility in Taneytown, Maryland, and a dispensary in Gaithersburg, Maryland, under the Herbology brand. Cureleaf, so Cureleaf uh, has paid for more cultivation space, it appears. Uh, again, we don't get any sort of amount on that either, but I'm sure that will come in time. But at the same time, Cureleaf has also completed the sale to Terra Ascend Corp of its interest in the HMS cultivation and processing facility in Frederick, Maryland, for a total consideration of $27.5 million, comprised of $25 million in cash and a $2.5 million note. So additionally, Cureleaf sold to Pharmacan its 100% interest in the Elevate Tacoma dispensary located in Tacoma Park, Maryland, and Grassroots Principles. 51% interest in the dispensary in Westminster, Maryland for total proceeds to the company of $3.9 million. So uh, whatever they paid for this cultivation facility, hopefully this $30.4 million that they've just made by selling off some of their previous assets will help compensate that so they don't have to go into any sort of debt or use their debt to pay for it. In hopes that Cureleaf's reorganization of its Maryland assets allows the company to upgrade its production capacity in the state and extend its customer reach while continuing to offer the same best-in-class patient care and access to Cureleaf's high-quality medical cannabis products, including grass, Grassroots and Select, America's number one cannabis oil brand. While on the same day, we do see this announcement from Terra Ascend completing acquisition acquisition of Maryland-based grower processor, announcing it's completed its previously announced acquisition of HMS Health LLC and HMS Processing LLC from Cureleaf Holdings for everything that I'd previously mentioned. What does this do for Terrasend? It allows them to expand their core Northeast footprint to include Maryland and gives them cultivation and processing capacity in Maryland to be significantly expanded by late 2021. So obviously Cureleaf wants more space, so they buy something new, but what they end up doing is selling off to another company looking for what Cureleaf has, no longer needs, so it just makes sense that, of course, these CEOs know each other. These companies know each other. They respect each other as they're all fighting for the same cause, you know, normalizing cannabis and bringing this industry to life. Uh, so it's just nice to see that, but also just makes sense that the more you look into the business, the more you become familiar with it, 
is that they all want to help each other win in time. While Jushi Holdings Inc. completes acquisition of two California retail dispensaries, building their footprint in the California market with second and third strategically located real di retail dispensaries in Palm Springs and Grover Beach, California. The biggest market in the country announcing that it has closed on its previously announced acquisition of 100% of the equity of Organic Solutions of the Desert LLC, an operating dispensary located in Palm Springs, California, and approximately 78% of the equity of a retail license holder located in Gro Grover Beach, California, with the option to acquire the remaining equity in the future. Jushi will be implementing its best-in-class customer-focused retail approach that includes the introduction of its online reservation ordering platform and express pickup options at the Palm Spring Dispensary. The company expects to complete the build-out of the Beyond Hello Grover Beach location in Q3 2021. The two new locations expand Jushi's footprint beyond its first California dispensary, Beyond Hello Santa Barbara, which opened in October 2020, so it seems like business is good there and they want more. Jushi also plans to add additional California location in Culver City, which is expected to open by Q2 2022, subject to state and regulatory approval. So as companies start to you know, gain their momentum uh, and build out their systems, they want to get into the key states that allow them to grow more. Now, some great alternative news. Turns out frequent cannabis consumers are actually more physically active than non-users, study finds, smashing stereotypes. How lovely. In a stereotype-busting new study, researchers found that frequent cannabis consumers are actually more likely to be physically active compared to their non-using counterparts. For decades, anti-cannabis propaganda has cast cannabis consumers as unmotivated couch potatoes. This government-funded ad is the perfect example. Think about it. This is the best education on the planet your government could have come up with. Clearly, they didn't try very hard, but this is where the taxpayers' dollars went. So, Sarah, what's going on here? Sarah? <laughs> Sarah. She won't answer you. Or she can't. Why not? This is the way it's been since she started smoking pot. She's all lazy and boring and... You know, we used to have so much fun together. And now? This is what we do. Are you sure it's Sarah that's lazy and boring? But in a study published in the Harm Reduction Journal on Thursday found the opposite to be true. A nationally representative analysis of accelerometer measured sedentary behavior showed that people who frequently use cannabis, particularly those age 40 and older, spend more time engaging in physical activities than non-users do. Our findings do not support the mainstream perception of cannabis users as living sedentary lifestyles, the researchers concluded. In general, they found that there's no significant differences between non-current cannabis users and light, moderate, or frequent cannabis users in minutes per day spent in sedentary behavior. The difference came down to the average minutes that each group spent in physical activity. So in a national population US-based sample, current cannabis users with current cannabis use was significantly associated with accelerometer measured physical activity such that frequent cannabis users engaged in greater minutes of light PA physical activity and moderate to vigorous physical activity compared to non-current users. The researchers also looked at the relationship between cannabis use, activity, and age, finding that people over 40 who consume cannabis moderately spent an average of 16 more minutes engaged in moderate physical activity each day than non-users. To explain that trend, the study suggests that cannabis is being used for exercise-induced pain recovery since physical activity brings about pain and muscle soreness, and a decreased pain threshold and muscle hypersensitivity have been documented with increasing age. These findings add to the cannabis and physical behavior literature by incorporating objective accelerometer measures, the researchers concluded. Further understanding of the association between cannabis use and health behaviors is essential to fully addressing the public health concerns associated with cannabis use. Gotta love new findings, though, that help put the old stereotypes to bed. And great news for West Virginians, eligible West Virginians can now register for medical cannabis cards. The West Virginia Office of Medical Cannabis announced eligible West Virginians with serious medical conditions can register for a medical cannabis patient card online. A list of physicians registered to certify patients as eligible for the use of medical cannabis is also available on the site. Though the registered physician will certify if the patient is eligible, the patient must apply for a patient identification card on the site. And the West Virginia Medical Cannabis Act permits West Virginia residents with serial med serious medical conditions to per procure medical cannabis for certified medical use in the following forms, pill, oil, topical forms, including gels, creams, or ointments, a form medically appropriate for administer administration by vaporization or nebulization, dry leaf or plant form, tincture, liquid, or dermal patch. So still pretty tight regulations, but regardless, this is great. 
because West Virginians now have access to a non-addictive, safe, alternative uh, pain reliever. And New York colleges increase cannabis courses amid, amid weed legalization. Just check out how many cannabis puns they tried to fit in here. Higher education, that's one, is taking on a new meaning in New York after the state legalized the recreational use of cannabis. Colleges and universities are adding new courses about cannabis to the syllabus to prepare students for jobs in the budding industry. That's two. And they're not just offering token lessons on the history of weed either. That's three. Online Excelsior College is marketing new master's degree courses in cannabis leading to a graduate certificate in cannabis control as well as expanding undergraduate classes we're in the space to educate people about the cannabis industry cannabis will be a multi-billion dollar industry in new york by 2025 scott dolan the dean of excelsior college's graduate program told the post yes and psst, in case you didn't know Cannabis is already a multi-billion dollar industry USA-wide. Cannabis is expected to be sold in local stores and pot shops sometime next year, but that is wise to prepare New Yorkers for the potential massive industry that's coming their way, and also wake these students up to the fact that it is already a massive industry all across the US and that it's time for them to start learning about it so they can eventually get a job in it and start paying attention. Sad news though, out of Mexico, Mexican lawmakers did fail to legalize cannabis ahead of their Supreme Court deadline. This session, it seemed like the reform would finally be achieved. The Senate approved a legalization bill late last year and then the Chamber of Deputies made revisions and passed it in March, sending it back to the originating chamber. A couple of Senate committees then took up and cleared the amended measure, but leaders quickly started signaling that certain revisions made the proposal unworkable, so politicians ruined it. Basically it. That's where the situation stood for weeks as the court's latest April 30th deadline approached. There was an expectation that the Senate would again ask the court for an extension, but that did not take place. Instead, lawmakers have begun floating the idea of holding a special legislative session after June's elections in order to get the job done this year. Um, so advocates, including those with Mexico Unido, are now pushing for a special session after lawmakers miss their deadline, which does make me a bit optimistic, uh, showing the severity of this deadline, as the Supreme Court did deem their current laws unconstitutional, which is why they need to fix it by this date. Clearly, they were not able to get that done, so instead of asking for an exception, they've begun floating the idea and looking for a possible solution to get this done after June's election by the end of this year. And that would mean by at least passing the bill and hopefully getting it signed by the end of this year. Regardless, welcome to investing, welcome to politics, and welcome to bureaucracy. It always slows things down and causes delays. But on top of this sad note, we do have breaking news out of Switzerland as Swiss Parliament votes in favor of adult use cannabis legalization. The National Council's Public Health Committee voted 13 votes to 11, with one abstention, to the parliamentary initiative by Representative Mr. Heinz Siegenthaler. Essentially, the aim of the, of the legislation is to regulate the cannabis market in Switzerland rather, th to th rather than continue to ban adult use. This vote will make Switzerland the first country in Europe to allow a legal adult use cannabis supply chain, according to reporting from Swiss news outlet Zurichsee Zitzun. Zitun, I don't know. The, mean, the move means that Switzerland instantly joins the avant-garde of European cannabis. However, this is only the first important hurdle for full legalization of cannabis in Switzerland. The bill next goes to the Swiss Senate, which is called the Council of States. With this move, the National Council's Public Health Commission has followed up on various other initiatives to legalize and regulate the cannabis market rather than continue with the prohibition of adult use cannabis. The proposed legislation has many features to protect Swiss consumers. Thank you, Switzerland, for taking that first step to adult use. Plus, if Switzerland wasn't already super high on your list of destinations to go visit based on the waterfalls, the valley towns, and the mountain views, if this is what Swiss women look like and they enjoy consuming cannabis, count me in for a visit post-COVID. And lastly, we've got an updated Cannabis Investor Earnings Conference Call Calendar with all of the LPs and MSOs that are going to be releasing earnings in the coming month. So it feels like just yesterday we were in March anticipating Q4 earnings to see how the companies did in 2020. Now it's May, and starting next week, we will already be able to see how these MSOs, most importantly, are performing and heading into Q1 of 2021 already on top of what they did last year. Uh, so I'm excited. You should be excited too. Let me know in the comments what you think. If you enjoyed this video, folks, please leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. Subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos, and I will catch you on Sunday for the next episode of This Week in Cannabis News. Have a great day, everybody.